On today's special edition of Survival Dispatch News, we're joined by James from Pilgrim Ammo. He's a former operator who's done many tours in the Middle East and is the final subject matter expert on our series on what we can learn from the recent attacks on Israel to protect ourselves better when the next terrorist attack hits the homeland. In this heightened environment, there's no question we're seeing an increase in reported threats, and we've got to be on the lookout, especially for lone actors who may take inspiration from recent events to commit violence of their own. And we're back with James from Pilgrim Ammo. Welcome to the podcast, James. Thanks, Mike. Good to see you again. Likewise. We've done a bunch of videos on these attacks on Israel and you know what we can learn from them. I've lost track of how many videos we've done now, but I can tell you you're batting cleanup on this. And <laughs> the reason you're batting cleanup is because you were deployed to the sandbox multiple times as private contractor yeah. and otherwise. So you've got some firsthand experience with dealing with these types of people. So let's just jump right in. Based on what you've seen that came out of this attack, what are some basic advice that you can give our audience as far as what to do if they find themselves on the X terrorist attack, active shooter event, whatever the case may be? Well, I mean, you know, the, the first thing to do, uh, I think, is you know, you got to keep 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 that calm head because you don't want to over panic and wrongfully assess the situation. I mean, you know, it's it was one thing over there where if you wrongfully assess things, you were getting into shit, but most of the time you, you were right. But when you're over here in the US of A, yeah, there's a lot of danger out there. There's a lot of things that could potentially go wrong right now. Firstly, keep a cool head, make sure you assess correctly. But then when you are sure, then you're going to have to act accordingly. One of the things that we mentioned in our discussion recently, that rave party that happened over there where guys were coming in on the, on the gliders, people saw what was going on, trying to get the hell out of there. And it was one of the guys that were one of the bad guys dressed up in a cop's uniform, stopping them. You know, in that sort of situation, you can see the guns, you can hear the guns going off. No cop is going to be keeping you contained in that area. And so obviously he's a bad guy too. I personally, I'd go straight through him. If he's trying to stop me, he'll either get out of the way or he'll no longer be a threat. I can I can read, I can watch videos and all that stuff, but I haven't been there like you have. And I've read from multiple people like yourself that have been in the sandbox that this is not uncommon for terrorists over there to pose as somebody else. I know. No, I mean, like you know, a lot of the times, I remember the first time I went over there, we were driving in a convoy. What looked like a woman and a small child just stepped out in the, in the middle of the road. And me being a greenhorn back then, you know, I took my foot off the gas. Okay. And the guy who was very, very seasoned for being over there, it was the first time that I'd been in a conflict zone. Okay. He literally whacked me in the side of the head and... He told me to floor it, and now they got out of the way. And I was just like, dude, you know, what if they didn't get out of the way? And I barely missed them. I'm sure I grazed them. And he said, what if what if they're wearing a vest? People know what our, people know what our, our, what our trucks look like. They know that we're not messing around. You've got a, you, you, the compassion that you have. You keep that for home. You're here to do a job. And think about it like this. If they're... If they're willing to give their life, we're fucked anyway. If, if they want you to stop... Okay, you're you're the stop. All somebody's got to do is take out the rear vehicle, and we're a real we're a real big problem. Okay, and he was right, man. I mean, you, you know, the, the the safety of your oppos is paramount. You're you're moving in a convoy. Okay, you can't second guess things. You've got to keep on going. So, I mean, if you are in that situation, as I said, keep a clear head. Be prepared. I mean, chance always favors the prepared. Make sure that you've got something, something in your truck or in your car or on your person that is going to be your way of getting home. Now, you don't know what's going to happen. There's a multitude of different things, and your, your state of preparedness can change from situation to situation. I've got three bags in my truck, depending on, I mean, what if you have an EMP? Everything goes out. Well, you're on foot, okay? So decent pair of hiking shoes, making sure you've got something to cover your whole body. What if you've just left the gym? 
Okay, now you train as well, mate. Okay, when you leave the gym, you're not wanting to put on something that's going to cover your legs, cover yourself properly. But having some proper boots and some BDUs inside your truck, okay, we'll quickly get on. Now we've got to put on my pack and figure out what I'm doing next. Okay, yeah. make sure that you've got what you need. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I mean, you've done some extended uh, deployments. You can testify as well as anybody the the value of having good footwear and extra socks. Oh Keith. fuck yeah, mate! Fuck yeah! <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. Everyone thought that it was just a stupid line from from the Forrest Gump movie, right? Um, you know, everyone just thought that was, that was stupid until you've been there and your feet are hurting, and sometimes just changing out your socks <laughs> when you get a chance to to stop for two seconds. Man, that can save your ass. Now, I mean, boots have come a long way <laughs> sure. since I was wearing them full time. But uh, yeah, mate, it's a, it's a thing. It's a thing. I mean, look at some of the the safety boots now that have composite toes in them. They don't weigh anything compared to old steel toes. They don't get cold like old steel toe boot. Yeah, it world of difference. Oh yeah, world of difference. And I mean, I. I <clears throat> I do a lot of stuff for five eleven, so you know the, those Vibram Soul things, mate, and they just fucking last forever, mind you. You know, I still, I've still got my first pair of, of boots that I was given in the Navy back oh, in '96. Wow, uh, and they're as comfortable as fuck. But uh, you, you don't get the ventilation and all the other stuff that you do out of the out of the modern technology. Well, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, you split your time between Florida and Tennessee, so temps are higher than average here in the southeast compared to other parts of the country. Yeah. And, you know, we get sent a, a ton of products. Most of them never make it onto our channel. But I can tell you, uh, you know, Victos sent us these vented, uh, you know, ankle-high boots for right. our climate. It, they're amazing, absolutely amazing. Whereas some other ones that are meant for more of a northern climate, I can't wear them in this heat. Like it just right. They're untenable. Hey, dude. I mean, just send me the link to them. I'd be I'd be interested in in, uh, in testing them out. I mean, as I said, I do a lot with Five Eleven. I love their jeans because they've got the mag. They've got right. the mag pockets in the back. Yeah, you've got your most people that can carry. They're they're wearing it underneath their their self or their, it's attached to their belt in some way, shape, or form. And whenever I'm out on the range, of course, you know, I put my my mags on the side where they need to be. But having two spare mag pouches at the back of the decks, they can't be overprepared, can you? Well, I think on this topic of being comfortable and whatnot as well, anybody who's worn a belt that's loaded up with, you know, pistol mags and whatever else, the older you get, the harder it is on your lower back. But stuff that's in your pockets, I find for me at least, set of BDUs with pockets with mags in them doesn't hurt my lower back like, say, a duty belt. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And what I usually keep in my truck isn't split sort of separate pants to shirt just the, the the bdu coveralls that have got the the belt part of it on the outside mate you know it's fucking very very easy very very quick to put on yeah as i said guys like you and me go to the gym and shit like that if you're just in your sweats you know all of a sudden you've got to quickly chuck something on putting on just some coveralls and get going it's quick and easy you know, we have some mutual friends, uh, Jason McCoy, Jason Sawyer and whatnot. They sleep with a set of cargo pants loaded with all their stuff beside the bed. So if something happens during the middle of the night, they get up, they put their pants on and they have all their EDC gear in the pants already. And they're ready to go just like that. That's a good idea. With the amount of people who've got cameras around, they'd like to see, still see the comedy of someone going out with their belt wrapped around them in their underwear with their boots on. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, for all seriousness sake, so having that ready to go, I think is the smart way to go. You can't be over prepared and making sure you've got everything in there to go. You know, as I said, I keep three bags in my truck, make sure I've got sufficient medical kit and building on that all the time and making sure that it's all up to date. That's the other right. thing. I mean, Medicines expire. The shit goes missing. I put aside a day once every quarter, just, okay, what am I going to need? What's going on? And improving gear as well. I've got a woman that lives nearby here who's literally one of my best customers. She buys from me a 1,000 rounds every second month nice. because she's late. She's got to be late 70s. You know, I've never 
I've never asked her exactly how old she is, but she's a South African woman, used to be in the ballet. She landed here some numbers, uh, you know, some years ago and did quite well for herself. But she's a prepper and she's got radios. We've fortified her house, got water filtration. She's got battery packs. She's got everything. But she uses our ammo because she's, she's an older woman. And the lessened recoil for her is is paramount. But she's even gone to to the uh, extent of we found her an old sort of late seventies, early eighties Land Rover Defender because if she needs to bug out, she'll bug out. But she's concerned about all the modern electronics. There are systems that are out now where you can have your vehicle protected. Right, um, EMP shield, one of them. E- EMP shields, yeah, exactly. Now, I haven't got into that for, for her, but she asked me to teach her how to change her solenoid uh, if she needed to, and I was just like, well, you, you did. You know, it's going to take you a while, but we'll teach you how to do it. But with an EMP going off, it's going to be the first thing that, that, that's that's going to go. But, yeah, I mean, she's, she's a real prepper. I think that she she's a subscriber with you guys as well. Nice. Well, actually, that's a great point. We're going to take a short break. Uh, James, for a special message from Jason Sawyer, and we'll be right back. Jason Sawyer with Survival Dispatch, and when disaster strikes, will you be ready? Power outages, natural disasters, economic collapse, and the knowledge, the skills, and equipment necessary to protect your family when it really, really matters. You can gain instant access to our team of survival experts stockpiling food, medical necessities, communication plans, proven techniques to help you get home, shelter in place, or bug out safely. Don't leave your family's safety to chance. Visit survivaldispatch.com and to get we're started. we're back once again with uh, James from Pilgrim Ammo, continuing our discussion on uh, what we can learn from this uh, situation in Israel as far as the original attacks were concerned. James, you just touched on, you, you've got a customer who's a uh, you know, a senior citizen, and she frequently buys large volume of of ammo from you. Let's let's go down that rabbit hole for a second. I mean, it's a bit of a Bye. shameless plug, but uh, you know, we're we're big fans of your ammo for some very specific reasons. So tell us, yeah, tell we, us the advantages for her and other people. Well, we, yeah, we appreciate the relationship we got with Survival Dispatch. That's why you, know, you probably see the code below Survival Dispatch ten. The advantages for uh, I'll just refer to her as Jean. She's an older woman, obviously lessened hand strength, and she's a she's a fit older lady. But the lessened recall for her is the biggest thing. But also, she wants to make sure that what she hits does the maximum amount of damage. Most important factors for her is, is twofold: is you know the the 30% less recoil. Okay, it's all listed on the back of our nine mil uh, boxes. You know, for the nine mil, 35% less recoil, 30% typically for the other ones. Moving at 2,000 feet per second, hitting with 450 foot pounds of kinetic energy. Now, it's one thing if the shit goes down. Okay, you're shooting what you're shooting, but also in that situation when things are going bad, you're going to not really have the ability to always be checking your background, okay? Like, there's going to be absolute chaos. Right. And if you've got a threat right in front of you, you know, most threats happen within six to ten feet. Close proximity. Okay? Yeah, exactly. What are you going to do? Are you going to not shoot somebody because you're not sure what's behind them? Yeah, they're not going to wait for you to be sure. You're going to have to pop them, and you want to make sure that all of that energy stays within your preferred target. Well, yeah, I was just so. going to say, let, let's dispel uh, an urban myth that plus P ammo is, is harder to handle. It's actually the exact opposite, that your 2,000 foot per second 9 mil has noticeably less muzzle flip than other ammo does and that in turn allows you to get back on target faster especially if you're double tapping right talk a little bit more as far as the benefits of your ammo i mean because there's more than just the reduced muzzle flip and reduced you know kickback well as i said you know we've got the the lessons recoil you know we've got the the kinetic energy delivery uh, we've got the zero over penetration, but also, I mean, the way that your weapon reacts is typical. And, and that's why Jean uses it. I mean, she doesn't use any range ammunition whatsoever. She's prepping. She knows how to uh, go down the range and do target practice. Any shooting that she does is tactical shooting. 
Okay. So and it's all yeah. close proximity target shooting. She does it out in a range with a specialist instructor. Uh, she's not messing around. She knows how to hit a target from 20 meters away. Well, you just hit the nail on the head, right? Like buying guns and putting them in your safe and going to the range occasionally isn't going to cut it. These are perishable skills, number one. And number two, you've got to do the tactical training piece that you just mentioned, because uh, as Mike Sterling says, people don't rise to the occasion. They fall to their level of training. So if you're not training, you're in trouble. But talk to me you know, about your projectile. You know, It looks like a five-gallon bucket. It's an absolutely yeah. huge hollow point. And you mentioned over-penetration, and you also mentioned the amount of damage that it does. Tell me how this projectile works. Like you, I've always got my mag with me. So what happens, this will penetrate barriers. So it'll go through drywall. It'll go through two by fours, <laughs> car doors. It'll penetrate uh, windshield glass accurately. We did a video with uh, Sheriff Mark Lamb, the American yeah. great patriot. And he was very surprised on how this accurately penetrated windshield glass and we were using gourds in that particular situation. He was surprised that the pumpkin just didn't explode. A lot of damage on the inside, but it didn't overpenetrate. We'll penetrate barriers. But what happens with this, you know, how we've got the, the noses crimped and the deepness of that cavity, what happens when it hits a soft target, okay, i.e. flesh, hydraulic pressure builds up in the nose of that cavity. And instead of like with most hollow points, they mushroom. This explodes, okay? The hydraulic pressure has got to go somewhere. And the way that this has been manufactured, it literally explodes into an unconventional starburst pattern, okay? okay? So and we get frag naturally, fragments the projectile? You end up getting little chips of metal that just burst out into a starburst pattern, about a five-inch wound cavity in multiple different directions. You get a naturally forming base plate that typically goes through to about 11 inches, so now most other ammos, even, you know, hollow points, it's a very small wound channel and it goes through to 15 inches. Okay. And other ammo, it penetrates, you know, 15 inches, uh, sorry, 16 inches of gel block, like okay. the FBI says that it should. Now, I don't know too many people that have got a 15 to 16 inch chest cavity. So right. you're almost guaranteed with most of this ammo going all the way through. And then you've got to worry about, and we're not, we're not only talking about chaos situations now, we're talking about just general active shooter scenarios. You need to pop somebody. You, know, you can't always be sure. And then the other added thing is, what if it ricochets off a spine? What if it goes through and ricochets, you know, off of a lamppost or off a car or something like that? There's a multitude of different ways that the things could uh, could go. But yeah, for, for today's topic, you know, chaos. Yeah, you still want to take out the bad guys, but you don't want to be also wounding somebody that is just trying to get away from the chaos. So on the topic of hydrostatic shot, correct me if I'm wrong, but your ammo, your very unique ammo. If you were to shoot somebody, say, in this area, the hydrostatic shot theoretically could turn the left side of the heart into jelly, even though you didn't directly hit the heart, correct? Like it, it, when you mentioned oh, five inches? Yeah, about five inches. And, you know, I'll go to a, to another scenario where I got called up to a coroner's office up north. And a guy who was the coroner was also a part-time NRA instructor. Okay. And he called me and he said, you've got to get up here because I don't get this. I don't understand this. Now, it was a situation where a kid came home. When I say a kid, he was, he was a young bloke. He was, he was still old enough to have a gun uh, and have his license and yada, yada. Okay, but came home. His missus was shagging somebody else. Nice. This is not what you're supposed to do, but it is what happened. He pulled out his weapon and he shot the guy. Shot the guy in the groin. He shot him into the pelvic area. But with how this stuff breaks out, it ripped apart his femoral artery that badly that they couldn't even clamp it. Gotcha. When he got to the hospital, he was losing a lot of blood and there's nothing they could do for him but just make him comfortable and wait for him to die. That goes with your scenario that you're saying, yeah, you know, a five-inch starburst pattern. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to start doing from a marketing point of view and also like a man cave point of view is we're going to start selling ballistic gel on our website. Okay. okay, so if you really want to see what this does, buy a gel block, okay, put one shot in it, you'll see what it does. 
And it's you know, nothing, it's a nice thing for the man cave wall as well. We'll, we'll get you one as well so you can put one behind you. But, I have uh, one from you sitting on the floor over here. Well, I mean, you can, you can see how, how, how it really, really performs. And with the, the rounds that we've got coming out you know, later on this year, the 10 mil that we're, we've we been promising you for a long time and other people, the 5.56, five, we're getting into eight, six, and six, eight as well. We'll do the other stuff as well. But, uh, you know, uh, nine millimeter for the hoods, 10 millimeter for the woods. There you go. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, we appreciate your support. We really do. Having the right ammo, particularly, and I think that the risk of things going wrong, if you're having a look what's happening at the border, we, we support a, a company called Castle Enterprises that work on the border. They do the transportation of all the people coming through there. And we get a lot of information from there. Now, me personally, I wouldn't get involved with something that I don't agree with, but you know, working with FEMA and whatnot, that is their business. But the stories that you're hearing from you know, down there on the border, the amount of age appropriate for battle males that are mm -hmm. coming through from Middle East and North Africa from the southern border, A, it doesn't make sense to me on how they they got getting into the country and why. I, I mean, just yesterday there was a news report that they caught uh, something like 17 known terrorists from Syria, a dozen from The guy Ukraine. that had the AK tattoo on his arm? I don't recall if he had that on there or not, but it, it and I'm not a fan of Fox News, and I just caught their uh, feed on X Twitter, just did a quick read on it. But essentially, there were quite a few of them that were apprehended yesterday. I mean, we did a special episode of Survival Dispatch News with Don Mann, who you've met before, SEAL Team 6. Yeah. Don is still has a high level of top secret clearance. So he couldn't get into exact numbers, but he said, you know, in the 90s, we knew that there were at least 200 sleeper cells in the country. And all he could say was that it's exponentially more now. And of course, the, the pundits come out of the woodwork to say, you don't know that these people are doing this. Well, you know what? 159 different countries. We've got 73 plus thousand people of interest that have some sort of connection and then many hundreds that are actually known terrorists apprehended doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we got sleeper cells in the country it, it's a given it's not even worth debating with somebody bringing bringing us back to that james i personally think it's just a matter of time it's not if it's when we're going to get hit with some sort of attack on the homeland here so far you've covered some pretty valuable stuff the cops aren't going to stop you from leaving an active shooter scene from fleeing the scene. So if you encounter no. that, keep on going. Great advice. EDC wise, it's important that you have good ammo. I think I'd make another point, you know, for you guys as well. I mean, my wife carries your ammo is that it doesn't weigh shit compared to regular ammo. My wife no, plowed her pistol great. when I first load up. She's like, yeah, my, my pistol's not loaded. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, and Cindy's a strong woman, okay, but she, yeah, I mean, she, she knows her shit. And that's the other thing that that always is a lot of a lot of guys that are in the shops that we supply. They like carrying our ammo because it reduces their load around their around their belt, and or, you know, we're going to be doing a lot with LEO. Yeah, well, or conversely, allows you to carry more ammo at the same weight. It's yeah. it's it's the the old survival rifle argument that a 22 lr is the best all-around choice because you can carry so much ammo i don't think that I, I i don't foresee me being in a situation where i'm limited to one gun so no. the fact that i can load your ammo up and carry a ton of it is there's a relationship kind of the argument with 22 lr but before we carry on james we're going to take another quick break for a short message from uh, jj morris to Sign up for Survival Dispatch Insider. Survival Dispatch Insider. We bring together survival enthusiasts and preppers to share knowledge and skills, which means you can enhance your preparedness for emergencies and ensure the safety of your community. The results you'll get, improve your emergency preparedness by learning skills and strategies from experienced preppers. Build lasting connections with like-minded individuals to share your passion for safety and readiness. Access a wealth of knowledge and resources to assist you in protecting you and your community in certain situations. Go to survivaldispatch.com to get started. And we're back once again with uh, Pilgrim James, Pilgrim Ammunition. We're, we were just discussing ammo and the weight of your ammo being lessened so that you can carry more. Is there anything else we're missing from the ammo perspective before we move on to some other topics? Well, not really. I mean, it's all the things I think we've covered. Most important thing, and I've already said this once, is you're in a chaos situation. You don't want to be 
uh, wounding people that are just trying to get away. I mean, you've been in theaters of war, active theaters of war. The accuracy rate, even for trained professionals, uh, plummets in when the shit hits the fan. You know this. You've uh-huh. been there. I just want to drive the point home that you should practice the way that you play. So in other words, if you're shooting FMJ at the range and you're not moving at all or anything, and then you leave the range and you load up your EDC and you didn't shoot with it, it's not the same thing, right? No, totally not. Totally. And that's why, you know, in the military, you're not using one different ammo for the range and another, you know, another ammo for the fear of war. Exactly why, you know, I said to you before, that's why Gene orders. And, and I get cost comes into it. Gene's in, a, in a unique situation where she can afford it and she's very serious about what she's, she's doing with her prepping. Hats off. She's got the ability to do that. Now, just you've got to uh, practice with what you're carrying and you know, i can understand a little bit of target practice but then make sure when you're doing your tactical shoot use a box okay you don't need to unload your mag every time you do a tactical shoot you need to be able to draw quickly and get a shot or two on target you don't need to unload your mag just use it in a in a smart way well, I, I think another related point is dialing your optic in. When yep. you dial an optic in for something that, let's just bullshit numbers, is 100 grains versus something that's 50 grains, the optic is not going to be right for one of the two. Correct. Yeah. And the your weapon's going to react differently. And it just comes down to practice. You know, some of the some of the things that you've put me on, on to with, that are available electronically are a good way to, to hone that. And if you can couple that with training that you do at a range, that's great. I mean, if, if anyone's near Nashville, you know, the, the Glock store there has got a great range that nice. you can actually put people through scenario training there where you can learn to clear a house. You can do close quarters combat. I think right. there should be more of those ranges around. In- invaluable experience for sure. And, and I mean, yourself included, a bunch of us use the Mantis products for dry fire training. We're not an affiliate. We don't get paid by them. Love it. But it gives Love you it. the, you can practice in your backyard, whereas you can't with live fire. So most people who follow us know that I train actively run and gun with Mantis. I've also been training lately with the Berna Mission 4 less lethal rifle. That thing is a, it's a weapon, man. I mean, you can load it up with CS rounds, pepper rounds, not just solid kinetic rounds. And so in my mind, when I got into that, by the way, James, and I know you've been hit with some of these chemicals, <laughs> was that if yeah. you hit somebody in the chest, you get the payload directly in their face. Well, I spoke to some people who've done some some training with it without gas masks or anything, and they said that one of the projectiles hit a wall five feet away from them, and it still fucked them up for 45 minutes afterwards with the CS stuff, like shit running out of their nose and their eyes, <laughs> you name it. Oh, yeah, it's not a fun time. It's not a fun time. Denny's our resident guinea pig for that kind of stuff. I've taken shots from <laughs> kinetic rounds and lost some some skin, but he's the man when it comes to the, the really crazy stuff like pepper and, and tear gas and whatnot. So I want to ask you a question. I don't know if you had a chance or not to review any of the footage from the active shooter incident that happened at the Texas State Fair yesterday. But if you haven't seen it, let me, let me just give you the Cliff Notes version. There's oh, yeah. some footage that shows a very busy part of the fair. And you think of this in terms of terrorists as well. They're going to attack things like fairs and concerts and sporting events where they get inflict the maximum amount of damage. And there's all kinds of people, James, running around, running away. I wouldn't even say running away because they weren't moving fast enough. These were out of shape people. But they're stopping and looking over their shoulder. They're carrying their, you know, cotton candy and their Coke in each hand. So what's your advice to people who find themselves in that active shooter situation? What are what are the options and what should they practice? Well, okay, running around with a drinking cotton candy, and I get it. You know, the, the, the immediate thing is, well, this is mine and I bought it. But you're not going to be moving optimally while you're trying to keep your drink from spilling and you're holding on to cotton candy. So if it's something that you don't need, chuck it straight away. And first thing that you need to do... It seems like an obvious thing, but it's worth stating. So sorry to interrupt. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, people just have got the psychology. I bought this. Okay, it's mine. No, you don't need it. Chuck it. First thing to do while you get your bearings and you're figuring out what it is, there's, particularly at a fair, there's plenty of places 
where you can just get behind cover with your loved ones. Okay, you could be with your chick, you could be with your kids. Get behind cover. Make sure it's not a barbecue a truck that's got propane and shit like that, but get behind cover while so, you assess. So on that topic, for our audience who may not be familiar with all the terms, what's the difference between cover and concealment? Well, cover is somewhere where you can be as least exposed as possible. So you cannot get hit. So like behind yes. like a behind an engine in a car, for example, as opposed to being behind the trunk. Correct. Yeah, yeah, correct. I mean, they would have to be rolling with pretty significant ammo if it's going to go through a, a, a an engine block. Um, right. I don't know how things work with the new electric cars, but you know, an engine block. You know, good something point. That's sturdy. A good point, actually. Yeah, something sturdy, a brick wall, steel, somewhere where you can get your bearings, have a certain amount of, of cover, but you can see what's going going on. And then you can start hearing, where do you think the fire is coming from? And then you can calm your family down, calm your chick down, or you know, calm yourself and mm-hmm. figure out how am I going to get out of here? Where did I park? What is going to be the best way? And then start plotting your hops like you know when you're coming onto a target you're doing fire and movement you're checking where you're going to get to for your next set of cover so your team can move up when you're moving Mm. back with your loved ones doing the same thing if you've got a weapon on yourself you may want to pull it out however there's going to be law enforcement there as well you're going to have to be able to identify yourself as somebody that is not a threat you are just protecting yourself as well because in one of those situations, you've got a gun. The last thing you want to do is have a cop arrest you, okay, or shoot you or shoot because you've got you. a gun in your hands. You've got to be aware of what's happening around you. If you do see a cop, yell at it. I'm not a threat. I'm getting my family. Try to back him up. Try to roll with him and communicate. I think at the very least as well, there's a number of people out there who carry in condition zero, meaning that their their firearm's not loaded. I don't agree with that. I think you should always be in condition one, one in the chamber. But if you do carry in condition zero and the shit hits the fan, you better shuck that sucker as fast as you can and make sure you're in condition one. Exactly. And then you know, realize you're in a panic zone. You've still got to make sure, particularly if you're rolling with another person you're trying to get out of there with, make sure that that weapon is always pointed in a safe direction. The ground is not a bad place. The air is not a bad place. And then take it from there. We've had a bunch of subject matter experts weigh in on this topic. And everybody's offered fantastic advice. Almost everybody has universally said this run, duck and hide stuff. It's no good. Think of active shooter situations like the nightclub in Orlando where they went and hid in the bathroom. They have no means of egress and they were picked off like fish in a barrel. So with all that being said, they, everybody across the board said the same thing as you try to get your wits about you, but you're the first Mm -hmm. person who said, find cover, get your shit together get your family shit together or whoever's with you, then look for the means of egress and get out of Dodge at that point instead of just blindly fleeing without knowing what's going on. It's good advice, James. Well, mate, I mean, particularly, and if you're talking about the scenario of a state fair, most people, most blokes know that we may get some shit for me being sexist or something, but we're men. So most blokes are going to either be there with their chick or with their kids. Yeah. So if you've got multiple people with you, and let's just say your chick isn't as big into the prepping as you, she's just relying on you to take care of shit. He's not going to be an asset. Now, if you do have, have a lady like some of us do, I know you do, yeah. you know, she's going to be pulling right next to you and she's going to be able to say, to you, where are we going? What are we doing next? Okay. Sometimes, some situations, particularly with some of the female military ladies in this country, you know, they may have more experience in their bloke. You've I, got to- I, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again, though, because it's germane to this conversation. There's a big difference between chauvinism and chivalry and Uh, real men will step up and protect their wife, their girlfriend and their family. So if somebody wants to call that being chauvinistic, fuck them, literally fuck them. That's our role as the head of the house, as the man of the house, full stop. Yeah. But also, I mean, if you've got a chick who's done, you know, 20 deployments to the sandbox and she's an MP or, you know, she's an infantry woman or, or whatever, and you don't have that level of experience, well, sweetie, take the wheel and let me know what I got to do. 
Valid um, comment. My comments in yeah. general terms, generally speaking, the man is the, the protector of the house. And, and, and I agree with you. I, and, I totally agree with you. And I don't give a shit if people want to call that toxic masculinity or anything else. They probably shouldn't be following our channel if that's where their head's at. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. But yeah, man, I mean, <laughs> you just, <laughs> just for the purpose of the conversation, man, you just got to get your shit together because sometimes you may be in a situation where, you know, you can hear the gunfire and from where you are, the gunfire is moving away from where you are. So mm. maybe staying right where you are may be the best spot. Okay? In a defensible because, you know, position. Yeah, in a defensible position. Not, like in, a, not in a stall, in a bathroom, in a bar. Well, a stall in a bathroom, in a bar, you've got no way to get out. Oh, you yeah. just, you know, you're fishing a barrel. Don't do that. In a nightclub situation, there are always plenty of fire exits. You know, in that situation, I would stay down, get out, and then just get out of the situation. You know, use the fire exit. Everyone is, there's always signs on the uh, on the fire exit door saying, you know, the alarm will go off, do not use as an exit. They don't mean don't use as an exit when people are getting shot at. Yeah. Okay. It yeah. is, it's an emergency exit. D distance equals safety. Just to play devil's advocate here is that these Middle Eastern terrorists are renowned for putting people on the exits outside of a building so that when people try to exit this active shooting situation, they mow them down. Uh, Mike Sterling had some good advice. And he said, uh, if you're going to leave you know, an area that's an active shooting, try to find a means of egress that is maybe less known or less used, those sort of things, as opposed yep. to walking out the front door, which is similar to what you just said. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. I mean, you know, get the hell out of there. I mean, I hadn't heard about the, the thing that happened in Texas. I'd have to dig into it. But, yeah, I mean, that's just off the top of my head. That's the that's what I would do. We're going to look at that, the, the footage from that. We'll probably pick it apart as far as some of the mistakes that people made. I'll tell you what, the, the, what caught my eye is you've got all these overweight people trying to get away, and out of nowhere comes this black kid and – He's gone like a sprinter, and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> "What? that's a great example of the difference between being athletic or fit or even just healthy versus not. The rest of them, James, were, were sitting ducks, and that's why we, we try not to preach the, the exercise thing too much, but you know as well as I do, if, if you're fat and out of shape and you haven't practiced with your weapons, you will be amongst the very first people to meet an untimely death. Exactly, man. I mean, that's why you know I used to I used to get around at about three hundred and twenty pounds. I was I was a lifter like you and, and fairly big with it, but you're not as mobile with that. And since I had the accidents a couple of years ago, I'm concentrating more on well flexibility, durability, and can I run from here to there without being gassed? Uh, and it's a long long road for me, considering how badly I was hurt. But that's more important to me, and I actually feel better for it. Being able to move and run, it's the way to go. So here's a valid point. We're both in our mid-50s. We've both racked up a shit ton of injuries over the years. If we can still be active, if we can still improve on a daily basis, anybody can. Full stop. End of story. There's people well, out there have have nowhere near the mileage on their bodies that we do, and yet we can still do it. So if we can do it, they can do it. That's that's what Joe Rogan. It's an interesting interesting point you made, though. But Joe Rogan made uh, made a point of this with a female guest. I don't know who the chick was, but he said, "Yeah, it's a choice." He said, "If you can get up and walk to your fridge." You can exercise. And this is how I got into it. And he made this point on, on his thing. If you go to the gym or you make a point just to, all right, well, I'm starting today and I'm going to just get down on the floor and do as many push-ups as you can. Now, if you just do one push-up, honestly, you know, an honest push-up, chest to the floor, hold, up, press. And if that's what you've got, well, then all you got to do is make sure that you do two tomorrow and then three, and then build up. And then you get into, well, I can't run around the block, but I can walk around the block. Okay, you walk mm -hmm. around the block, and then you can see, I mean, it, it's, it's a journey. You're not going to be an athlete straight away. Quick question. Have you ever met or talked to Tony Blower? No, I have not. Yeah, no, I, it was a loaded question. I, I know you haven't. What's really interesting yeah. is that he's – at the highest level when it comes to self-defense, not just physically, but mentally as well. And right. you know, he travels around the world 
training people, whether it be your average Joe law enforcement, military or whatever. He came up with a thing in the 1990s that he calls tactical snacks. So you don't have time to get to the gym or you're not so inclined to go to the gym. Oh, would you look at that? It's top of the hour. I'm going to stop and do 10 push-ups, 15 push-ups, 20 push-ups. And then top of the next hour, he'll stop for 30, 40 seconds, do another 10 or 12 push-ups. If you add the, it's what you're saying. If you add it up over the course of a day, a week, a month, a year, you're talking yep. thousands of reps over the course of a year, but you didn't drive to the gym. You didn't burn up an hour and a half, two hours of your day. You just did these, he calls them tactical snacks. Well, you look at guys in the shoe. What the fuck? Did you see that shit? <laughs> I saw that, man. You look very pretty. That's that's the Thank best. You. I mean, you look at guys that are in the shoe. They've got a yard, but there's no weights in it because they're in the shoe. All they've got is the ability to lift bags of water or do push-ups or do burpees or do something. The gym is nice because you know, it helps you get to the next place quicker. But if you don't have a, a chance, and when we were starting out in, in, in the military, you know, you'd be dog-tired because you're going through all the shit and you're sitting in classes that aren't necessarily interesting. And my PO used to say to me, if you're starting to fall asleep, just get down, do 10 push-ups and you'll be right. And he was 100% correct. You know, if you're sitting there in, in your office, and yeah, it's not convenient for everybody, but just step away somewhere where you know you're going to pump out 10. All right, boom, I'm awake again. And you're also getting that benefit of being able to move your body and also being able to uh, do a chin up. The list of benefits is long, right? You get a release of endorphins to so get your head back in the game. It accelerates your uh, metabolic rate, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing these things earlier in the day. It sets the tone of your metabolism for the day. I mean, yeah, there's there's countless yeah. reasons why people should get off their ass. Dr. Jason Dean says, you know, get rid of your bonbons, turn Netflix off and go do something. But you don't have to 100%. do it for an extended period of time. Is And I don't think people clearly understand that. So, James, there's been some some fantastic recommendations on your part. And I guess like the hardest part of batting cleanup like you're doing is is to not repeat what previous subject matter experts have said. And you've echoed some of that stuff, but you've made some really great recommendations. I want to speak to one more thing before we wrap this up. And I don't give a shit if people think that it's a, a shameless plug or not. Do, do you pay us at Survival Dispatch? No, we do not. Okay. So let's be clear on something. You completely fucked our relationship with every body panel manufacturer out there. <laughs> completely destroyed our relationship with all of them. And, and you've participated in a lot of this as well. So I want to get this out there though. And, and this is how you wrecked our relationship. We get sent, well, we used to get sent <laughs> a lot of different body panels from a lot of different companies. And let's talk 3A body panels that are lightweight. You can, you know, half a dozen shots from a 44 Magnum, theoretically you're protected from them. Still get some concussion on the backside, which isn't fun, but you probably didn't get penetrated. We've thrown underwood ammo, 10 millimeter, 90 grain, 1600 foot per second ammo at 3A panels, and they've all done what they were supposed to do and stood up to it. But the second that we hit them with your 2000 foot per second, 50 grain, 9 millimeter, turned every last one of them into Swiss cheese. And at the end of the day, speed kills. And that seems to me is one of the biggest value adds of your ammo versus your regular ammo that people have out there. Well, yeah. And, and for the topic of the day, while we're trying to prepare your listeners on how to be prepared, if things kick off here, the bad guys are going to have access to the same shit. Yeah. So making sure that you've got adequate body armor and there is... There is one or two companies out there that do stand up to 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 our ammunition. I know the Las Vegas PD, they use a, a plate that will stand up to it. A lot of the body armor companies, they just, you know, as I saw on one of the, the videos that, that you did with, uh, was it Jason or Denny, but you turned that plate into Swiss cheese using those, uh, those pistol caliber carbines. So I think there's some important distinctions here. So uh, 3A body armor isn't super heavy like other panels. It's much more comfortable to wear. Look at here we go again. Anyway, it's entertaining for me, but uh, yeah, I guess. So, <laughs> what my point was is that they all advertise that they can repel nine millimeter rounds, and not all nine millimeter rounds are created equally. 
and they don't repel yours. And we have not seen a single 3A panel do that. Now, level yep. three plates and level four plates that are rifle rated. My God. Just, I feel like I'm on a fucking Barbie show or something, man. I've turned that feature off in Mac OS Sonoma and it just keeps on doing it. So whatever. But my point is this, is that th those body plates that have stood up to your ammo are not yep. 3A. They're level three, they're level four, they're rated for rifles and they come Correct. with a weight penalty. So, yep. uh, you know, I can take a plate carrier put two level four ceramic plates in it that weigh less than five pounds each full, you know, a few fully loaded magazines into it. It's over 20 pounds, just like that. And yep. that's a lot of weight to be carrying around when you're trying to run away from danger. It goes down to the fitness as well. And you know, we're starting sure to work with, with a couple of different body armor manufacturers. While my point before was the bad guys are going to have access to the same sort of shit and, Typically, they usually go for cheap and good. So if you're, you know, for for your own stuff, A, you know, you may want to have something that is going to do maximum damage in your weapon, but you also may want to make sure that you've got adequate armor for yourself. As I said, we're working with, with a couple of different manufacturers where, you know, we're going to help them develop their product to stand up for ours because, you know, we want to make sure that we protect the good guys. But if you do have these situations and some of these bad guys are wearing armor where well, you want to be able to drop them. P people don't know what they don't know. So we're not faulting individuals. No. But if the average person picks up a level four plate, level three plate, a level three, a plate, they're going to think, man, this isn't too heavy. I can wear this. And Oh, it says on the label here that it will protect me against the most common handgun round out there, which is nine millimeter. And that's just mm -hmm. not true. Speed kills. So, James, listen, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. There'll be a link to your website below, a discount code. It's not an affiliate yep. code. We're not getting paid for this. We just, we we eat our own dog food. We practice what we preach. Anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? No, mate, just thanks once again, mate. It's always worthwhile getting on a conversation with you. I said for a long time, some of the private conversations we have had over the years, you know, should have been on a podcast. And, you know, this is all valuable information. Yeah, it sure is. Thanks again to our favorite Australian. Thanks, Scott.